Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Agile Automation Strategies in a Genomic Core Facility. I am Michelle Ashton of Labworth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labworth and brought to you by Beckman Coulter. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.beckman.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Jurgen Zimmerman, the Senior Engineer at the GenCore facility in Heidelberg, Germany. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Jurgen, you may now begin your presentation. Today I'd like to talk about the automation strategies at Genco, with particular focusing on single sequence library preparation applications. Uh, but before, I'd like to give you a short overflow uh, about EMBL then actually the structure of gene core and our automation considerations before I come then finally to our single cell sequencing methods. EMBL is an intergovernmental organization founded in 1974 by Sir John Kendrew and James Watson. It's currently funded by 26 member states and some additional states. They are mainly located coming, mainly located in Europe, but also Australia, Israel and Argentina are now members. EMBL is located at six different sites. The main laboratory is located in Heidelberg. Structural biology has private beam lines at the DAISY and Petra in Hamburg, as well as the ISRF in Grenoble. Our bioinformatics outstation, the EBI, is located in Hingston. Additional outstations in Barcelona and Rome are concentrating on disease modeling and neurobiology. Uh, EMBL already concentrated quite early uh, competence and technologies in certain core facilities. It started with the AA Advanced Light Microscopy Facility, uh, the Electron Microscopy Facility, and Genomics and well uh, other portfolios summing up currently to 10 facilities. Uh, the core facilities, as well as the EMBL itself, is collaborating with a broad range of industries like uh, instrument companies like Beckman, Olympus, and Leica, as well as biochemical instrument, biochemical companies like NEB or Illumina, as well as others, and a broad range of pharmaceutical companies like Beringer. Uh, GeneCore itself, has currently a user base of 800 users coming worldwide. Our user base is limited to members from the laboratory itself, as well as certain scientific programs like Young Investigator Program, which is actually worldwide, or medical research programs. In the next slide, I'd like to give you an overview about the tremendous changes and growths uh, GeneCore encounters since the last years. The sample growth over the last eight years was coming close to exceptional growth, and at the same time, our resources remain more, more or less constant. So the headcount ranges between five and seven, uh, and our automation instruments really dropped by 50%. The reason for the last is that actually we change from very inefficient instruments quite efficient instruments from uh, from Beckman right now. Uh, I also like to give you a 
the overview about the quite heterogeneous population of samples we are dealing with. So mainly, of course, it's human and mouse, but actually the rest spans really between apple viruses, uh, deep sea urchin extremophiles, and some other sample types. In the next two slides, you will see really quite the dynamics of uh, the needs of the users we are serving just between two years. Here you see that uh, RNA-seq is currently contributing with 22%, de novo sequencing with 5%, and for example, CHIP-seq with 15%. One year later, the picture looks totally different. We are dealing with 52% of RNA-seq. Uh, de novo sequencing is really triplicating, um, and CHIP-seq remains constant. You see also that quant-seq sequencing is slowly evolving, so the next year it will look totally different again, I can promise you it now. This is mainly driven by the availability of new instrumentation from the beginning of 2008 with a very limited beginning for uh, massive parallel sequencing. It evolved into the Illumina sequencer systems like 2000, 2500, now 4000. Uh, then the next seq system came, and with good ions we have here currently and with the minions, uh, also the, the novo sequencing field opened. We see it also in how well it's accepted by the users we have. So initially 2014, only high seq requests were there, and this were mainly replaced completely by next seq using. Now I'd like to continue with some automation considerations. Actually, what are the criteria GeneCore is following for deciding their instruments, running their projects, and actually, what are they mainly taking care of before we're deciding for an instrument and how we are running the automation procedures afterwards. So this is a slide from Bert Bernie, which I really like. It shows the different states uh, you are undergoing until you have really a full functioning system and actually the cost commitment you have. So actually you have in the beginning a very high failure rate. Uh, Hopefully, this low investment, and at the end, you should end with a very high throughput uh, with low failure rate. So initially, you are starting with the design phase. We are actually make a, design a process, map, make some base, minimal baseline, how it should work at the end. In the next step of development, uh, you are developing your protocols, maybe a prototype where you like, like to go in there, so everything should but clear, you should see the first results at this step already. The next step, which is the most critical and the most demanding one, get the whole thing stable. That you really can rely on it when you're going to upscaling to the final production phase. So if you're going starting with pre-designed protocols, you get these phases are quite short and actually uh, there shouldn't be so much risk in there in these gateway reviews you have to do. But if you're starting with brandly new one, uh, it can get demand. So now coming uh, just to the project considerations, if you're going for automation and instrument selection, so it's always good to start with a short detailed documentation of requirements, what you really need and where you like, like to go. And you should stick to that. Any changes during it may cause drastic delay and in the worst case scenario, even more costs. One of the basic criteria should be the throughput. Actually, what is your current throughput you like to cover, but also you should uh, have a very reliable gross estimate for the future. Okay, there is a lot of variation in there. You don't know how user needs are developing, but you should make it roughly between 10, 15, or even more percent. But to really come to a precise design of the system, you should make a critical pathway analysis, also uh, finding the rate limiting step. Is really the pipetting the right rate limiting step, or is it the PCR machine, incubation times, or whatsoever? And this will really guide the design of the system and further decisions. Uh, the question is, do you like for a dedicated system, which is, can do things in very high throughput, but limited number of applications it can handle. Or if you like to do with a modular automation where you have all the flexibility you need, even if the chemistry is out of fashion in the next six months and you have to do something different. The instrument specs 
to get from the companies when you're deciding for a system should be chosen only as guidelines. Mainly they are one with water and some further more artificial considerations. Um, so take them as a guideline, but also be prepared that they may not fit your specific need. But on the positive side, the companies are also quite conservative uh, to guarantee the functionality. So sometimes they're also surprised how much you can get out of the system they have. You should also go uh, into the discussion, where do you like to save most of your costs? Do you think you can save it in work? Can you save it in consumables, in chemistry, or which other parameters are most important? This is also the this is precise in a way. Uh, you should be aware that this plug and play protocols you always get offered from companies are most of the time illusions also made under certain artificial uh, assumptions which are behind there. So if you're planning for project time, always assume a longer period for that. You should set priorities. So initially you should go for the core functions that you can deliver results primarily. And in the second step, you're going for supportive functionality you need in, in your process. Interfacing, if you have a limb structure uh, or other systems where you like automatically document what's happening on the machine or in your workflow, maybe a little bit demanding also, because sometimes the APIs within the systems are not uh, compatible in the way. So I mentioned here an artificial uh, word which is named DART. This is a core functionality in the Beckman systems. We uh, decided for which take already most of the work out of your hands before it's going to limb system or any other things. Uh, one main criteria is of course easy to use software, but actually I put the easiness, especially in quotation marks, because easiness is really a wide field. Easiness for us is quite simple. So even if we are a newbie and the instrument has been set up and the application engineer has given you an introduction to you, uh, the next day you should be able uh, at least to set up a small, easy program uh, like moving plates around, pipetting liquid from one plate to another within an hour. Everything which takes longer is not easy to use software. There should be training available, which makes you very fast independently. One or two training, uh, trainings, software trainings should be enough to put you in the position that you are independent for most of the jobs you are doing. Uh, you should have proper development tools, which allow an automatic versioning, which a proper software documentation, which helps you in asking most of your questions. Selection of vendor is a, another parameter. It should be reliable. It, the company should be existent for some time already, and uh, it should be responsive if you ask your questions. Uh, they should offer su sustainable maintenance and support because you may need it, and if they don't have the personnel you cover your need, then it's a problem, especially for core facilities. Uh, Ask for references from others. They are always quite helpful. And in all the projects uh, you are starting, think of some unexpected to happen, which means, for example, that the company who is delivering uh, the micro plates can't deliver for six weeks or something, and uh, then the whole project may get into delay because as the robotic companies have also their schedules to plan this. Method considerations are also the next step if you would like to go more granular in the process. So in, according to our experience, no manual protocol is mapping one-to-one -to, -one to an automated version. So don't stick to a written protocol totally. There are a lot of parameters you have to change. And this is the experience uh, actually the company is offering to you who's automating the process and also the experience of the biochemical supplier you have. But sometimes they are contradictional. I have to warn you in that. But there I 
the automation experience is superseding the paper protocol, definitely. So we have several cases where we just have to adjust, like mixing, like uh, other parameters, and then it works much better. So at the end, the stability and the reproducibility of your results should be the first aim. So you should be always aware of protocol mists like uh, the fresh ethanol. If you check your old physical chemistry books, you would see that ethanol is going into saturation within two, five to six minutes. So the fresh that up doesn't help too much. The stability of the chemicals, for example, also there the biochemical companies are very restrictive and conservative. So there's always uh, more additional times in storage at room temperature, for example. As I mentioned before, mixing procedures need to be optimized. In some cases, you will encounter lower yield with basic settings you also found in manual protocols. So it's, but you have the possibility to adjust. Just an additional PCR cycle would cover. But there are also protocols where robots definitely yield better, better, better results than uh, the manual protocols you get from the company. We definitely have to be aware of dead volumes. Most kit suppliers have a very limited amount of stock chemicals in there. And uh, there you sometimes have to use additional chemistry. Uh, next parameter is on deck PCR, off deck PCR. Gene code decides definitely for full walk away automation. And so the on deck PCR was necessary already from the beginning but we check it with a lot of biochemical tests. I will come to these results later, so you can have a short look and judge on your own. Washing tips. Uh, this may be really strange for you, but it's really depending on the design of the washing station. So the washing station we have found on the Biomex have individual wash bowls with active flow and pipe heading. Uh, we made the calculation that actually we have uh, dilution factors which are going uh, 10 to the power of 30 something. And actually we made also biochemical testing to be on the safe side. And so we kept the step in there. One thing is a regular calibration run of, of the instruments for QC and agree on a realistic uh, FAT. So the final results should be compared comparable to manual results. And you should always do the burn in tests with control samples and with a functional validated chemical kit to be sure that no other influences are, are there. Uh, if you have a wide variety of samples like we have in the core facilities, you can do these other tests later. But initially you need to know, is the kit running, is the uh, robot running? You should expect realistic standard deviation and CVs and truths in pipetting. That's all for now. Based on this initial criteria, we came to the final setup and said, okay, we like to have 50 to 2,500 samples per week. We like to have real walk away. We like to change protocols in a very fast manner. As you see, this was necessary from the initial graphs. And we like to go with modular automation. It's much easier to have by another robot doing the same functionality or adding just late hotels or something like that to scale up, no dedicated machine. And we like to have at the final aim, increased process control, reduce human in interaction and uh, improve the consistency between the samples. Our current uh, automation infrastructure you're seeing here, we have two Biomac FXPs, so with dual heads. Is those we are operating since 2011, and we have a Biomec E7, which is in our house since 2017. So here already on the old, in quotation marks, FXP, you see an integrated PCR cycler, which can do the PCRs doing the, the controlled incubations at uh, higher temperatures, and it can be used for uh, hybridization reactions. In the background, you see Peltiers for cooling, for stock chemicals, and you have some space uh, for plates and tips. The i7 has a much higher capacity, more than twice. The detailed picture you see later. 
So now I come to the implementation criteria in one example. So here you see on several cases the comparison between two sequencing kits. The most important ones are on the upper right and the lower left. On the horizontal lane, you see the content of CG. And on the vertical lane, you see some arbitrary values for read count. Uh, the upper right picture shows a very neat distribution of read counts, nearly independent of the GC content, where the other kit is really failing in higher AT content and also declining in GC content. So you should be sure about the chemistry you like to automate. That's just the point in there. The next question is, does the machine work? Here we have the uh, case where we actually checked uh, a channel machine from uh, from another company. So we checked it in five repetitions uh, on five columns. So on the horizontal lane are the channel numbers. On the uh, vertical lane, you see the absorbent with tetracine. And actually, you see over a lot of positions a large variation between uh, individual channels. And actually, also position-wise, you see positional effects. Actually, the aim was to see the distribution of channel 8 everywhere. But the company was not able to achieve this, so the machine went back. Uh, these are the results we get from, from the Biomag with a 96 volt head. On the upper left, you see the calibration for different volumes. Curve. On the lower picture, you see just the uh, accuracy or inaccuracy uh, over complete 96 well. And on the right side, you see the uh, CV variance over the plate. So if you're going to the calculation over all of the plates, you see an inaccuracy from 3.11% and 4% CV, and that's for uh, 5 microliters and 3. Uh, now we're coming to the functional tests. So uh, the initial test is just the standard. We like to see uh, if are the library amounts okay. So here we have, uh, based on the NED DNA kits, we see 50 nanograms per microliter. That's okay. And the next step, we are going for reproducibility within the plate. Quite neat. The next step is we are looking for reproducibility over the run. And again, passed. The next thing is, does the variable size selection works also here? The next thing is this cross contamination checks I mentioned before. So we went with checkerboards. Complete microtata plate is filled with all reactants with the exception of the template. We add the template only to each second well horizontally and vertically. So each second well should be empty, which you see here. Uh, we did the same thing with endpoint PCR. We also make bioinformatics check adding adjacent to each other uh, different organisms, and it was also not detectable there. So all the things were passed, and actually these are the basic creatine before we went to the automation of protocols you see here. Uh, so it's from Illumina, it's true sick RNA. Then from NAB, we have several ones like uh, RNA directional with and without ribodepletion. We have NAB single cell. On NEB, we go with ChIPSEC. NEB, where we have a cancer hotpot, hotspot panel with, uh, with brilliant results, then Quantic. There's another. Uh, then we have exon capture with SureSelect, another single cell protocol is with TransSeq from Ashley Sanders, and then several logistical uh, functions like reformatting for fragment analyzer, dual ind indexing with volume checking, and all of this. Takara SmartSig is another single cell protocol I will show later. And Strantic is another uh, single cell. TN5 is single cell. Strantic HT is single cell. And we have another set of protocols we are currently working on. So now I like to switch to the sample applications uh, where we go to some single cell uh, methods. Uh, here we have some additional considerations we have to make. Uh, to prevent really loss of single cells during the process. So initially, we are not making any source material transfer to any sister plate. We are taking fresh tips in all transfer, just with the exception of peat wash, also to 
prevent accidentally transfer. Most of the protocols you see later have fragmentation steps, which are time critical. So all the plates we have to process in time sync to prevent any uh, unreproducibility there. We have to use low retention plastics. We have to add a pulse to catch small droplets which may uh, remain at the well of uh, the tubes after mixing. So we have to optimize our mixing procedures uh, for the small volumes, and we have to reduce drastically the dead volumes. So all protocols started with flow sorting based on a BND melody system, which to double staining. Uh, the second stain is to distinguish between dead and alive cells. Then uh, the cells are deposited uh, by the sorter in certain type of plates. Uh, we have a positive control in there. We will spot uh, tensor, assorted 10 cells in, into a plate volume, which you see in the cookie, uh, which is coming quite quite fast up. And we have negative control. So let's start with Takara. So the first step is uh, propriety. So it's Takara SmarterSeq, I think, which is well known by now. And actually, it's starting with sorting the cell, lysing, then it's a one-step cDNA synthesis and amplification, uh, purification the normal way, and uh, uh, then we have uh, next Nextera XT from Illumina for the library preparation. So this is the workflow as it is seen on the Biomec i7. So it's very transparent. So everything is clickable and resolvable to individual steps. This is for the pre-dispensing the, the lysis plate, which is currently marked green. Then we have the cDNA synthesis below. And uh, the next step in the tree is the library preparation, segmentation, and purification. All is accompanied by IDing the plates, which allows them that recording uh, all the initial and all the final and all the transitional steps in the tree. If you look at the user in interface, to see that we can uh, execute the whole protocol completely or in all of these three individual steps. Uh, we have selectors for on-deck cycler. Currently, we are processing here 96 samples. And uh, you can select the different options. So you see the plates. All plates are resource plates are lidded. And then we have a PCR lid for the integrated PCR cycler. And uh, these are the results. So roughly we are with 100 picogram per microliter. So we are in range of the proposed values from Takara to continue for the next step. So here we have the next step. That's the library preparation, the fragmentation. Uh, here the tips looking a little bit different. They are already littered in there. And those are prepared for the next step for higher throughput. Uh, so we can process more samples in the uh, next version of the protocol. So also here we see an individual library uh, from from the first series. The amounts are OK. And uh, in the beginning, you see a small spike. And actually, already in the next version of the protocol, we have removed it uh, successfully because we made some modification in the uh, purification pro uh, protocol, and the second one is a pooled sample. So from that point of view, the protocol has, has already passed all criteria. Uh, the ne next protocol is NAPNEXT single cell. It's based al also on the lysis of, of the cells. The next step is the re reverse transcription. Uh, with a template switching, then DNA amplification, cleanup, and then it's following the normal NEB library preparation procedure. Here we are limited to 96 samples. Everything, most of the deck is used. And also here you can add parameters like, which are necessary to change and allow flexibility for the reprogram. So here we have also the comparison between a single cell library and pool with, with individual samples. And it's all comparable to manual driven samples. The next protocol is a little bit outstanding, as the initial ones deal 
with RNA, this is a protocol dealing with DNA, and also it has a different purpose. It's not, it's using strength seek, but the main purpose is not the sequence itself. It's for tracking homologous within in a cell. By incorporating BOOM, the UF field during cell division, uh, you can you can mark even the individual strands and track those during the whole process. So at the end, you can strength, get strength-specific, high-resolution information about genomic rearrangement. And uh, this is currently outstanding. Uh, so in the first step, uh, you isolated the cells. Then you're doing the cell sorting. The procedure is as before. Uh, then it's continuing with some MNAs treatment, followed by end repair, A tailing. So then you have the UV uh, Hux treatment to provide to provoke strand nicking, and uh, then you're going the PCR amplification and then the conventional DNA analysis. And you're looking at a small picture, 70, step 77 to 81. You see the uh, the analysis just. The details are not important, but you see already there that you have green dashes and yellow dashes, which are just, just reciprocal uh, on the different chromosomes, and which shows you already what's going on there. Um, so the initial setup was based on the FX, and now we are on, on the I I7, because we like to have a full walk away, and shortening the running time by 50%. We are now able to shorten the running time on the FX already by 30% by some protocol changes. We like to do scaling down, where we are already successful for the factor of two. And we like to do mass time experiment, which was not possible on the FX because of deck limitation. Because here we just have uh, in total 16 open positions. One is, is the T robot itself, then we have the orbital LTAs, and then we have uh, 12 positions in the middle of the deck for pipetting. Uh, these are the steps, which are also as modular as in the other uh, protocol, as, as you have seen. So the MNA treatment, and repair A tailing ligation, and with a lot of purification in between. This is then the layout on, on the I7. And there you see the capacity we have to run through. And even using the additional uh, leper feeders, you're seeing on, on the left side here, which allowing to stack a lot of plates and tip boxes in, uh, below the deck of the instrument itself. And we have a barcode reader to track the whole. From the results, you see a very nice comparison between the biomech and the human uh, pipetter. And you see that the coverage is substantially higher. It's going up to the range of 0, 0, 0.05, and the map reads are even the power of 10 higher than the human operator. This, if you look at the more statistics, I think currently we are more than close to 40,000 libraries. Uh, the success rate is quite high. And uh, the detection levels of rearrangement on all of the robots we have seen so far is much better than on the human operator. So my conclusion is that the flexible automation we have gone for with the Beckman instruments can cope with the fast throughput increases we, we have faced, the varying demands. And I would like to add that even the conventional automation systems, which are available now, are easy uh, to handle single cell applications in our lab. Liquid handlers can be better than human operators in data quality. And automation methods we have achieved are stable. Pull away, walk away, automation including on the PCR are possible and actually also needed. So here are the list of our collaborators. This is Malta, Ashley, and uh, within EMBL, Vladimir is the head of genomics core facility. Ferris and Laura have started on the Biomech. We get great support from Martin, Sach, and Alicia from Beckman, and from the other companies from the protocols I was not able to show here. This is our team, pictures, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jürgen, for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, 
please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, can you give us some more details about cost savings? There are actually three, three factors contributing on costs. One is uh, the human work. The second are the plastic disposables. And the third one are the consumables. In human work, you have uh, first the setup time on the robot, which is roughly for a complicated protocol half an hour. So you have to take it into account. So which means setting up the plates, covering the deck, and preparing the master mixer. There I would say that's the only thing which is then used for the protocol. So if you have the substantial throughput in the whole thing, then it saves a completed position. If the throughput is lower, then you set the people really free from repetitive work and also more demanding work, still for the jobs a robot can't do or for further development. Uh, so I think this is the most substantial factor in there. The second one for the disposables, this is really a point where you have uh, taken into account, do you like to wash tips or not? If you are, have certain steps where you like to reuse tips and to wash tips, then you can save up to 20% there. Also depending on the throughput and the conditions how you can buy uh, tips. For the chemicals, uh, uh, there, they have to take into account two additional parameters. Uh, A is that, in principle, the dead volumes you have to use on a machine are slightly higher. And a manual operator is able to really catch a small droplet out of a tube, and actually robots can't, can't do this. Um, so this is definitely would mean more costs in there. Uh, but on the other side, if you are able to downscale protocols, which is partially possible with some of them, some of them are factor four, sometimes two, sometimes not. Uh, so in some of the cases, you can gain also cost savings there in the range of 30%, 40%. And on the uh, other side, you have to take into account it may be even slightly more expensive, but which is actually covered completely by the savings and work. Thank you. Okay, your next question. How long does it take to implement a method realistically? Frankly speaking, a month. Uh, you may think that that's, that's a long number, a long time. However, you have to see the following. It can, be happy when it's shorter. We also uh, have implementations which just last a week. But you have to take into account the following things. So first, the protocol. Let's let's assume you have a, a pre-made protocol, setting up uh, it on the machines, adapted to a working day deck. Uh, it's a matter of days. A matter of a day. Sorry. Then running uh, a dry run to see that there are no errors has, has been in there. It's also a matter of hours. The same thing with a red run. So that's that's clear. But then I come in, come in the next phase, and this is based also of the interaction with the lab because it starts with control samples. So running a library will take six hours, 10 hours. That's really depending on the protocol itself. Then it's going to QA. So then, uh, and then it's going for sequencing. For the initial test runs, if you make the run first, go on those four samples, that can be handled in, in a day. But then if you're going then to eight and 12 samples to make a really a small scaling out tests, this which I would be the next one, then you have to go on the sequencer to take 16 hours, 12 hours. It's really depending which sequencer and which information you like to have. So it can take several days until you have the result and know that it's really working. So the delays are coming from, from the back. And on average, what I have seen is 
it's very important that the interaction with the lab personnel is working, that there is really an assistant, uh, a lab mate on, on the other side, who is then helping to the application specialist to set it up. And that's definitely a point. We have everything here in, in house, which make, makes it easy. So this is definitely shorting. And you should be aware that sometime a plastic company or even a, a large company, which is a major player in sequencing, is not able to deliver in time. And uh, also robotic companies have their schedules and uh, then sometimes it may cause delays. So be happy about a week. I think technically realistic are two weeks, but with all the things happening around, I think a month is well. Thank you. Okay, this next question is a two-part question. You mentioned lower library yields. Any explanation, and how about data quality? Um, that's a difficult question, I have to, have to admit. Neither we or the biotech companies we have contacted have an explanation why, why this is there. And because everything was right, and done in a proper way. There was no criticism coming from, from that side, but we saw it. On the other hand, we have also some protocols with higher yields and even better data quality. You have seen it like in the uh, StrandSeq protocol here. It's also, for example, in the cancer panel uh, protocol where we actually get a factor of 10 better in some coverage values, and uh, we are better in also some detection value. And uh, currently, this is unclear. So we just have to live with it, and we can compensate it, and I think that's, that's the most important thing. And in all the cases, we are compensated, for example, with one single additional PCR cycle. Uh, in the worst case scenario, we don't see a worsening of the data quality. There, it's identical. That's uh, the point as we see it in the tradition. Currently, we are producing 80,000 samples a year, and currently we haven't seen any decline in, in that. Great, thank you. Okay, we have another two-part question. How stable are the implemented protocols and how stable are the robots running? Let's start with the second part. Uh, the robots are stable. They get only unstable if you make a crash. So this is mainly driven by user error if they're placing wrong hardware on, on wrong positions. And uh, this can yield into a crash. Most of the cases can be healed more or less on, on, on its own. Uh, but uh, just by the process like training a user can do on, on his own. And in some rare cases, uh, there are if repair needed. So, but this is mainly driven by a user and a well-trained user who is taking care that nothing happening. Nevertheless, I would consider some preventive maintenance and some regular checking. What I've suggested in my talk was also this regular checking uh, of the pipetting accuracy. But actually, when we started, we checked it every month. And now we are in the range of every six months, and we haven't seen any major change in those values. And so we are quite confident that we have a stable automated infrastructure here. Protocol stability, the only factors which are, can influence uh, protocol stability we have seen in our lab is uh, that actually instability of the kits we get delivered. And there's also some one large provider of sequencing kit, uh, which is bound to some instruments. And there we had sometimes variabilities in the kits where some components are misbehaving. And this can lead to a complete failure. And there you have really to be careful before charging a robot, really checking the chemistry. And in another, from another company, we get different efficient 
strategy in primers. And so there we have differently cases where we saw that it's driven by the kids themselves. Uh, it's always good to have a control during the runs if you like, like to feel safe in that point. But if the protocols have been developed, developed properly and if you have run after your FIT some real real samples coming from your service environment where you would say, okay, this is an average sample, this is a difficult sample, this is a good sample, then you had already a very good impression how stable your protocol is. So actually in our hands, F1 protocol has been set up once, the company of the chemistry is stable, then we are running the protocol for ages. Currently, we started with uh, two seq RNA, uh, just really early in the beginning of our automation uh, period here, and the protocol is running unmodified now, I think, for five years. So, yeah, I think roughly five years. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have time for one more question. How many samples can be run with the Takara method? Uh, you, saw, you have seen the different numbers on the on, on the two screens. So uh, on uh, so actually currently it's designed for 192 samples in a run. And uh, we are currently making some estimates how we can handle it in a different way to even go further up in a single run. But currently, with the current design, 192 is achievable. Thank you again, Jurgen, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. LabRoots will alert you via email when this webinar is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may miss today's event. Until next time, goodbye.